So thank you, Dr. Pfeffer, as well as the COA, for giving the opportunity to speak today. So I'll be talking about perineal tendon tears. What do we do with them? Do we repair? Do we transfer? Do we replace? So I have no financial conflicts of interest, but I would like to give some credit to Dr. Schoen, uh, Guyton, and Cripple for some of their work with the images and content of these slides. So perineal tendon tears, uh, most commonly presenting as persistent lateral ankle pain after an ankle sprain. Acute ruptures are fairly rare. Most commonly, you're seeing these chronically. Uh, and you want to look for concurrent tendon subluxation or instability, including ankle instability, as well as heel varus alignment. Non-operative management mainstays are bracing, physical therapy. Operative management is where it gets pretty confusing, and this is what I'll be focusing on today. How do we know what to do? Do we repair? Do we do a tenodesis? Do we do a transfer? Do we do a reconstruction? Uh, the literature overall is pretty limited and pretty vague and inconclusive, so how are we supposed to know what to do? So first, let's talk about classification. Uh, classification guiding management. This was from Krauss and Brodsky's paper in 1998, where they created this classification based on their cohort of 20 patients. They developed this cutoff of 50% and developed two grades, uh, grade one and grade two, based on whether more or less than 50% of the tendon was viable. And they did either a repair with a running 3 row vicral tubularizing the tendon or a tenodesis proximally and distally. But why 50%? Where did this come from? Um, they stated, we believe that when greater than 50% of the cross-sectional area of the tendon is destroyed, too little remains to be functional. This could result in excessively high stress in the remaining tendon and lead to its eventual complete rupture. But again, where did this come from? The source that they cited was this paper from 1933 in JBJS, um, and unlike Dr. Mikulski, I unfortunately did not have access to the full original article, uh, but I did find that this was a case report of a rupture of the flexor pollicis longus tendon three months after a colleague's rupture, after a colleague's fracture. Additionally, um, in this paper, they admitted their own limitations that the tears were complex and multiple in all patients. Typically, the pattern was of several parallel, partial, and or full thickness longitudinal splits, such as that seen here, and that this new classification system presumes that the retained portion of the tendon has no longitudinal tears. So if this doesn't apply to the majority of the tears that we're seeing, what are we supposed to do? This is the class, the management algorithm proposed by Redford and Meyerson in 2004, and this is essentially the cornerstone of the literature on perineal tendon tears. So I'll break this down a little further. This was based on a retrospective review of 28 patients, and they subdivided their uh, management based on whether the tendons were, quote, intact or usable. So first, if both tendons are grossly intact, a type 1, they propose repairing, excising, and tubularizing, for which, in their instance, they use 3 vicral. Now, this is a pretty busy slide, but I wanted to capture some of the biggest studies that are out there on how do these repairs do. So going back to that Krauss and Brodsky study of 20 patients, they used 3 vicral to tubularize as well, and they tubularized everyone. They did a superior perine uh, perineal retinacular repair and SBR repair on all their patients, a groove deepening on almost half, and they cast it for five weeks, non-weight-bearing post-op. They found pretty high satisfaction, 82% satisfied with that reservation, but 18% still had pain at rest, and 36% um, were only able to get back to unlimited activities. Steele and Dorio in 2007, they, their cohort of 30 patients, they didn't specify what type of suture they used, but they didn't do groove deepening very often, only 10%. Um, they didn't delineate their post-op protocol, and they found that 15% still had considerable difficulty on uneven ground, over half had persistent lateral ankle swelling, and about a third still had pain at rest. Um, only 46% of their patients were able to return to some type of sporting activity. Sudinsky and Burlett in 2015 had the biggest cohort of patients, 201, 71 present in final follow-up, they used Vicryl and Monocryl, did an SBR repair in about a third of their patient, uh, only 4% groove deepening, casted for four weeks, and they found uh, pretty promising results. They said 83% returned to exercise and sports. So what's in? I think repairing is still in. Um, data shows some variety, but overall repairs show positive outcomes. What's still unclear is that all the literature talks about this tubularization, but why are we doing it? There's no real science behind it. What suture do we use? When we're tubularizing, should we be doing groove deepening? Does that create just more mass within the fibular groove? Should we concurrently groove deepen everyone? So unclear why tubularization is in concurrently with repair, but somewhat by group proxy, it is in. 
Now, moving on to when one tendon is torn and the other is usable, do we do a tenodesis? Do we do allograft? So tenodesis is, uh, benefits include its native tissue, it's relatively easy, and doing a proximal distal tenodesis improves power and loads of failure. But how do we do it? Does it matter? This was a study from FAO in 2018 where they used five matched cadaver ankles and they compared side to side versus pulver taff with the two at the bond. They found that the failure in all their constructs was the result of distal stitch tearing proximally to the tendon and that there was no statistically significant difference for any of their metrics of load to failure, displacement, energy absorbed to failure, or peak load. So it doesn't really matter, it seems, how we do it. So as Tina is in, I'm gonna give this a question mark. There's not a lot of specific data on how we do tenodesis, how they do. Going back to that Krauss and Brodsky study, they actually showed only 66% of their patients were satisfied with their tenodesis. So even though it's done pretty commonly, distal tenodesis can be bulky. There's not literature showing it, but I've seen that the wounds can become a little attenuated from the distal tenodesis being bulky. Then what about doing a longest of brevis transfer into the fifth metatarsal base instead? It recreates the line of pull, doesn't create that bulk. Why don't we do that more often? So now, what if both tendons are torn and there's no proximal excursion of the muscle? What do we do? Tendon transfer, what tendon do we use? This is a paper from Brodsky in 2013. They had a cohort of eight patients. They did a vertical bone tunnel. Um, they tensioned the foot in maximum eversion and casted for eight weeks post-op. They had great results. Seven out of eight, they said, returned to pre-op activity levels. None of them required bracing. And eight out of eight were satisfied. When they compared their cohort of FDL and FHL, they said the FHL cohort had greater eversion strength and overall greater satisfaction. However, shown in 2019 that their cohort of 15 patients used only FDL, they tensioned the foot in 15 degrees of plantar flexion and maximum eversion, um, limited motion for six weeks as well, and they found 15 out of 15 were satisfied. However, they noted that they had almost 60% less eversion, 28% less inversion, and on average, 56% less power compared to their contralateral limb despite this high satisfaction rate. So tendon transfer, is it in? I think it's in. There's good data showing that it does have good results. Um, you could do FHL or FDL. But what if there's both tendons involved um, and there is proximal muscle, muscle excursion, then what do we do? So I think this is the, the kind of the most uh, progressive area of this. Uh, of this topic is using allograft. Um, what are the benefits? It spares the native anatomy, you replace the entire length of the tendon, and you can restore normal mechanics. And I think that this is now the most common treatment for this situation. So there have been several studies recently on this. Nunley came out with two studies, one in 2013, 14 patients, where they did pulver taft weave proximally distally. They tensioned their muscle at 50% muscle excursion, limited motion for six weeks, and they found that nine out of 14 achieved five out of five eversion and all returned to pre-op activity levels. Their study in 2016 was a cadaveric study where they actually loaded the tendons at tensioning at 50 and 100% physiological load. Um, they recorded their distal tendon tension and they actually found comparing tenodesis with allograft that the tension after allograft was significantly greater than the tenodesis in all loaded, uh, loading conditions. So should we be doing allograft instead of tenodesing? And this is a, a data from um, my fellowship, not yet published, but it was a cohort of 73 patients who were, uh, 32 of which were secondary procedures or revision procedures using two of our and a combination of either suture anchor, bone tunnel, or side-to-side -side tenodesis distally. Uh, we found a significant decrease in DAS, and only four out of 73 were using an ASO brace at follow-up. So what's in? I think allograft is in. It's still a newer method. Uh, data's still coming out, but results are promising. So should we be using allograft instead of doing tenodesis? Some limited studies say yes. So with all this, there's still a lot of questions. Some are answered, but a lot of questions remain. So how do we tension tenodesis, tendon transfer, allograft? Some say maximum eversion. Some say um, plantar flexion of 50 degrees. How do we know? Uh, do we do it at 50% muscle excursion? Doesn't matter. And again, what about doing the longest the brevis transfer into the fifth metatarsal base? Does that avoid that distal tenodesis being bulky? And post-op, are we still casting? All the literature says that everyone's still casting. They're limiting motion for six to eight weeks, but I didn't see a lot of casting in training. And if we're doing tendon work, isn't the whole goal to get motion regained early? And isn't casting gonna be limiting that motion, scarring down tissue? So a lot of questions still remain. Thank you. Great.